So let's see if this is rolling. It is good. So this is Professor Scambalori or Professor Scam just checking in. Um, I decided to record some of my lectures. Um, I have a habit of getting very excited about certain topics and when I get excited I start talking very very quickly which is a problem for some people. Um, it also doesn't help that I'm Italian, so I naturally talk pretty quickly and throw my arms all over the place. Um, so that way I'm recording the lectures. So if you miss something in class or if um, I kind of blew through a topic too quickly and you didn't ask me to go over it, you can always go back to these lectures um, and listen to them over and over again, especially if you just miss hearing my voice. I understand. Um, if you hear a slight snoring sound behind me, that is, once again, my cat Figaro. Um, he is sleeping on the futon and makes a habit of whenever I try to do these videos of sleeping and snoring um, while I'm doing them. All right, so in this lecture, we're going over the topic of transcription. Now, what is transcription? Well, transcription is what I like to say or describe as DNA-directed RNA synthesis and is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. That enzyme is RNA polymerase. You can think of RNA polymerase as the George Clooney from Ocean Eleven, right? So RNA polymerase is the George Clooney of RNA synthesis. So this is a genetic process where a single strand of DNA acts as a template for the construction of a complementary strand of RNA. Now, typically, when we're talking about that complementary um, RNA strand, we're referring to a strand of mRNA or messenger, MR, uh, messenger RNA. That's what sort of acts as the intermediate. Um, it'll carry the code for that gene um, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, where it can then be um, incorporated into a ribosome and read and then translated into a protein. Okay, so again, the whole flow of a genetic message, taking it from its original form in DNA and then actually creating a protein from it, it's like a two-step process. So you start with DNA that becomes mRNA that becomes a protein. So you have DNA, which serves as your template, transcribed into a single strand of mRNA, and that mRNA is then translated by a ribosome to form a protein. So transcription is required. Um, you need it to make the mRNA um, and also a functional RNA because um, that will give you the triplet unit of codons that can then be translated into an amino acid sequence and there you get a protein. So as we had said earlier um, towards the beginning of uh, the class lectures, the timing and location of transcription and translation uh, differs between your prokaryotic cells and your eukaryotic cells. And that's because prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, right? So their transcription and translation can occur in the same place at the same time. And this is a very efficient me um, method in that it allows them to adapt to certain stochastic changes or rapid changes in the environment um, very quickly. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are a little more complicated. Now, eukaryotes are always more complicated. Um, they just have to be that way. It's like life. Life always has to be complicated. So eukaryotes have a nucleus. That means the location and timing of transcription and translation are different because transcription has to occur in the nucleus while translation occurs in the cytoplasm. And you can't have them occur at the same time because you need transcription to happen first, and then you can have that followed by translation. Now also in eukaryotes, you have to go through these processing activities, and we'll get into those in a little bit. But when you have that initial product of mRNA from transcription, it's called pre-mRNA. It's your um, immature mRNA strand. That strand has to get processed. Um, and the reason it has to be process processed is so that you can have efficient transport of it out of the nucleus. If you just transport this 
immature mRNA unit, it will get broken down um, by certain enzymes before it can even be translated. So you'll go through these processing activities, you get your mature functional mRNA strand, and that mature strand is then um, escorted out of the nucleus and transcribed. So again, timing is different, location is different. So as I ask my students, is there a universal RNA polymerase that just does all of the transcription in all of the cells? The answer is no. If you're a prokaryotic cell and you're uh, transcribing one of your prokaryotic genes, then yes, prokaryotes use the same RNA polymerase to transcribe all of their genes. But this is not the case for your eukaryotes, right? Again, they have to be more complicated. So eukaryotes have three different types of RNA polymerase. Um, they have RNA polymerase one, which is used uh, to catalyze um, the formation of your rRNA molecules, um, which is the type of RNA that you find in the large and small subunits of the ribosome, uh, primarily the, the large subunit. Um, then they have RNA polymerase two. This is what's used in transcription for eukaryotic genes, right? This is what's transcribing your mRNA strand. And then the third polymerase, RNA polymerase three, that's what's used to um, catalyze or synthesize your tRNA, which comes into play with translation. That's what carries the amino acids into the ribosome. Okay, so when we're talking about the RNA polymerase, yeah, you have RNA polymerase two for your karyotes, and then you just have this universal RNA polymerase for prokaryotes, but they all have the same purpose, right? So RNA polymerase is, again, your George Clooney of the show. It's your builder enzyme, um, in that the protein can either build up or break down the substrate it is acting on. Um, in this case, the enzyme catalyzes the chemical reactions uh, that synthesize RNA using the gene's DNA as a template. So it works, in other words, to build a strand of RNA that's complementary to your DNA template. Um, now looking at the name RNA polymerase, Polymerase indicates that it's involved with some sort of dehydration synthesis polymerization reaction, right? So ase refers to enzyme, polymer refers to those long strands that are created by repeated subunits of monomers. So from the name you can derive that RNA is an enzyme that builds a polymer. And again, in this case, it's building a polymer from uh, through that's basically a growing chain of nucleotides. So it's taking your monomer, which is a nucleotide, and adding them together to create your polymer or your nucleic acid. Um, and it does this through a dehydration synthesis reaction, right? The catalytic function of RNA polymerase is the formation of phosphodiester linkages. Those are created via dehydration synthesis, the removal of a water molecule, to link your adjacent nucleotides together. And that's how it forms your mRNA strand, right? Adding one nucleotide at the three prime end of your growing mRNA strand, because it's reading your template, moving in the three prime to five prime direction so that it can build or synthesize your complementary mRNA strand five prime to three prime. Okay. So when we're talking about the RNA polymerase, um, again, eukaryotes are complicated. They always have to be complicated. Their polymerases are made up of many, many subunits, and each subunit is built by a different gene. So when I'm talking about many subunits, I'm referring to like 10 to 15 different subunits. The RNA polymerase for your prokaryotes they're a little easier to handle. Um, for your RNA polymerase, there are only five subunits. Now, the first two are your alpha subunits, alpha one and alpha two. Both are expressed by a different gene, but they have the same purpose. 
The purpose of the alpha subunits, um, they're needed to assemble the polymerase on the DNA. Then you have your um, beta prime subunit, which is here. This simply binds the DNA template strand. And then you have a beta subunit. The beta subunit will bind with the ribonucleoside triphosphate that will become part of the nascent mRNA strand. Now remember, we talked about a nucleoside, which is different than a nucleotide. A nucleus, nucleoside is um, just your pentose sugar, in this case ribose. So it's just your pentose sugar and your nitrogenous base. It doesn't have the phosphate group. So that's what separates it from a nucleotide. However, this nucleoside is then attached to three phosphate groups, hence the triphosphate. All right, so you have your uh, that little ribonucleoside, and that's just your initial mRNA. So when you have just these four subunits, your two alphas, your beta, and your beta prime, you have what is called the RNA's polymerase core enzyme. When you add the fifth subunit, the sigma factor or your sigma subunit, you get the RNA polymerase hollow enzyme. Now, a hollow enzyme is your full uh, functioning molecule. It contains all of the subunits. Um, and this, I mean, the sigma factor is very important. So you'll have different uh, sub sigma subunits um, for different um, molecules because each one will give a different specificity for different promoters. Um, in fact, the whole purpose of the sigma subunit is to bind with one of the sequences in the promoter so that your RNA polymerase can bind to the correct spot on the promoter. So in other words, your alpha, uh, sorry, your sigma factor, um, it's involved only in transcription initi initiation and it confers transcriptional specificity such that polymerase can begin to synthesize your mRNA strand from an appropriate initiation site. Again, when you have all five subunits, you have your hollow enzyme. All right, so there are three steps to transcription. You have initiation, which is um, when you have the transcription apparatus assemble onto your promoter, and that starts the synthesis of RNA. And you can also regulate uh, transcription from um, this stage by either making modifications to the promoter or um, involving a minor promoter that's situated upstream of your major promoter. We talked about that in, uh, I don't remember what gene it was, but we talked about that when we were talking about um, uh, your non-coding RNA sequences, um, their role in epigenetics. And then there was one that actually puts itself right in the middle of the promoter um, to prevent the bonding or binding of certain transcription factors to facilitate trans transcription. Um, the second stage is elongation. So elongation, that's the actual um, transcription part per se. That's when your RNA polymerase reads through the DNA template strand, um, running, it's, well, reading three prime to five prime. As it's doing that, it's continuously unwinding the double helix immediately in front of the polymerase while rewinding it immediately behind and is creating new nucleotides um, to the three prime end of the synthesized RNA strand. So it's creating mRNA in the five prime to three prime direction. The third stage is termination. So this is the recognition of the end of transcription. You'll run into something called a, a transcription termination sequence or unit, and that separates the RNA molecule from the DNA template and allows for the liberation of your newly synthesized mRNA. And when we talk about transcription, I like to say that it's all about your promoters and how they interact with a protein. As I was just saying, a lot of times you can influence transcription by acting at this stage, by making modifications to the promoters that prevent them from interacting with a protein. In the one example, a sequence preventing the binding of transcription factors, which are a needed protein for um, eukaryotic promoters. 
Um, and when we talk about initiation, I like to think of your RNA polymerase as just having trouble getting to where it needs to be. So these promoters will interact with a certain protein to help facilitate the binding of your RNA polymerase to the promoter so that you can have efficient uh, transcription of a gene. So with the bacterial promoter structure, um, the actual promoter is comprised of a variety of unique consensus sequences. And consensus sequence, they are short regions of highly similar DNA sequences. So again, there's many that comprise them, um, comprise each promoter. A lot of them are unique across species. However, there are two that occur in all uh, prokaryotic promoters, and that is your negative 35 consensus and your negative 10 consensus, or your primno box. Now, the numbers just um, indicate how many nucleotides away or upstream they are from your plus one site or your transcription um, start site. So your negative 35 consensus region, this is the site where your sigma factor will bind. So your little RNA polymerase is out over here. It has the sigma factor in it. So it's your hollow enzyme. And your sigma factor will bind to or base pair with this. It recognizes and base pairs to this consensus sequence. And that's what allows the RNA polymerase to get onto the promoter, right, at the proper area for a proper location for um, transcription. Now, your negative 10 consensus sequence, um, this actually facilitates the unwinding of your DNA template. And you'll have the first several phosphodiester bonds made here. Um, so when we have the RNA polymerase recognize, well, the sigma factor recognizes your negative 35 consensus, and then that situates your RNA polymerase correctly on the promoter. And then you have the formation of your first several phosphodiester linkages. After those two steps, you have what is called initiation of transcription. So in order for transcription to be initiated in your bacteria, you have to have um, the binding of your sigma factor and the formation of your first several phosphodiester linkages. Now, after that occurs, your sigma factor will dissociate um, off of your RNA polymerase because it's no longer needed. So what's the molecule or the form of your RNA polymerase that's actually doing the transcribing or going through elongation and termination will be your core enzyme. So you start with your hollow enzyme because you need your sigma factor, and then you go through and end with your core enzyme because again, the sigma factor is no longer needed. Now, eukaryotes, again, they always have to be more complicated. So with RNA polymerase 2, remember that's the form of polymerase that we are using for um, transcribing eukaryotic genes. I like to think of this uh, polymerase 2 as that one friend, that very special friend we all have, who just is running in a million different directions, is always 30 minutes late to any event, never has all their ducks in a row, is just um, a complete hot mess. So that is RNA polymerase two. So RNA polymerase two needs a lot of help to get to where they need to go, to get to the core promoter. Um, and that will come into play in a little bit with initiation um, through the interaction of transcription factors. Now, when we look at the actual promoter, promoter region here, um, there are these sequences that are about uh, 50 to 200 100 nucleotides upstream of your plus one site. Um, and they will bind specific proteins to um, specifically or strictly regulate transcription by either turning it up or turning it down. And these are what are called your proximal control elements. Um, and when we talk about the proximal control elements, we specifically mean these two here, your GC box um, at the negative 100 position and your cat box at the negative 80. 
Now, your control elements can either be um, cis-acting or trans-acting. Um, cis regulatory elements, um, they occur in the same molecule of DNA um, as the gene that they regulate. Whereas your trans regulatory um, elements, we think of those more as proteins or they're considered more to be proteins um, because they will act on a different gene than the one that they are um, actually transcribed from or located on. Um, so these are movable or mobile elements and they usually will bind to a cis acting sequence. So again, these two here are cis acting because they are situated on the DNA of the gene that they are regulating. Um, you also will sometimes have distal promoter elements, distal meaning they're further away from your um, initiation site. Some of them will be further upstream. Uh, some of them will actually be downstream. Um, the ones that are further upstream, those are where sometimes you have um, the formation of those uh, minor promoters that can actually um, influence uh, your major promoter. So those are your proximal control elements. And then those are situated upstream of your core promoter. Everything this way is upstream, this way is downstream. So here's your core promoter. Now the eukaryotic core promoter is comprised of two specific components. You have a short um, initiation sequence or your INR, your plus one site. And then you have a sequence called the TATA box. Um, the TATA box is uh, a highly conserved element and it's actually required for the initiation of transcription in all eukaryotic genes. And you'll find these in all eukaryotic promoters. Um, and I'll talk about their um, purpose in a moment. All right, so now that we talked about the promoters, we can actually go into initiation. So with bacteria or your prokaryotes, remember you start with your hollow enzyme. So here's your RNA polymerase hollow enzyme. You have your two alpha subunits, your beta and beta prime, and your sigma subunit. Now your sigma subunit will recognize and bind to your negative 35 consensus sequence. And that situates your hollow enzyme onto the promoter at the correct region for uh, transcription. And then your negative 10 consensus, this guy right here, he's peeking out a little bit here, will start to unwind your double helix in this region so that the first uh, several phosphodiester linkages can be made. Once you have those um, first phosphodiester bonds made, your sigma bond, or your, sorry, your sigma factor will dissociate, meaning it leaves your RNA polymerase because it's no longer needed. At this point, your RNA polymerase is a core enzyme because it only has four subunits. When it has the four subunits, your two alphas, your beta and your beta prime, it's the core enzyme. And this is the form that will go through the rest of transcription. This does the elongation and will go through termination. You start with your hollow enzyme. Your hollow enzyme is what initiates transcription. And you know it's a hollow enzyme because it has all five subunits. Remember, a hollow enzyme is your full functioning molecule. So you have your two alphas. You have your beta, beta prime, and sigma. Eukaryotic initiation, again, has to be much more complicated because your little RNA polymerase 2, which is the form of RNA polymerase that's used for um, transcribing mRNA in eukaryotes, is what we call a hot mess. So RNA polymerase relies on, or I should say the initiation of um, transcription in eukaryotes relies on what are called transcription factors. Now, transcription factors are proteins. Um, and they help the RNA polymerase recognize the promoter region and then correctly align the RNA polymerase to that promoter region. Um, otherwise, you don't get efficient binding and you everything just goes downhill. So 
To start off, a component of your transcription factor 2D, which is this guy here, um, called your TBP, binds to the DNA using the Tata box. Remember, we talked about the Tata box. This is your highly conserved special region. Um, and the binding of the TBP to the Tata box uh, situates your transcription factor 2D near the transcription initiation site. Now, TBP stands for Tata binding protein. Um, when your Tata binding protein or your TBP is bound to the DNA, other transcription factors or other proteins can interact with its convex surface um, at this TBP saddle. So your TBP, again, is required for transcription initiation on all types of eukaryotic promoters and are super important, one, because it puts or um, situates your transcription factor 2D on a proper location right at the Tata -ta box. And again, because it's bound to the DNA, other transcription factors can interact with its convex surface. In this case, you have an interaction um, and binding of two transcription factors, uh, transcription factor 2A and transcription factor 2B. Altogether, these units form what is called the transcription, transcription initiation complex. Now, this complex prepares the DNA for successful binding of your RNA polymerase. Now, before your RNA polymerase, well, your RNA polymerase will recognize this complex and will then situate itself um, on the proper location, meaning the promoter, um, and other transcription factors will bind to help facilitate this. But before your RNA polymerase can actually start transcribing, something else has to occur. In this case, you need energy. Energy has to be put into the system. So where does that energy come from? Well, the energy is um, obtained or utilized um, as GTP, which is guanosine 5-triphosphate. That's the type of energy that's used. And it's provided by the reduction of ATP into ADP and PI. So once you have that happen, you have the reduction of ATP, you get your GTP from that reduction. Um, your RNA polymerase can then synthesize your mRNA strand using the DNA template. Once your RNA polymerase begins to transcribe, so now it's here, it starts to transcribe, your transcription factors will dissociate um, and be released because, again, they're no longer needed. They are simply needed to help the RNA polymerase um, get situated um, at a correct location or proper location for transcription and so that they can um, facilitate the binding of the polymerase to, to the promoter. All right, so now following um, initiation, you go into the third stage of transcription, which is elongation. During elongation, um, you'll have the RNA tracking along your DNA uh, template, and it's synthesizing your mRNA in the five prime to three prime direction while it's moving along the template, three prime to five prime. And again, the DNA is continuously unwound in front of the polymerase and then rewound behind it. And that's just so it can access um, that template strand. And while this is happening, um, the, you have, again, the formation of your mRNA. Now the actual sequence of that transcript is governed by base pairing. So the base pairing that's occurring between your DNA template and the RNA strand controls that sequence because they have to be complementary to each other. Um, the RNA polymerase also acts as a stable linker between your DNA template and nascent um, RNA. Um, and that's important because at this point, the base pairings don't have quite enough stability. Um, so the RNA polymerase helps to stabilize that. All right, and then you move into your third stage. You've gone through elongation and the RNA polymerase has reached um, your transcription termination unit. So what happens? Well, you need the termination of transcription. That's what needs to occur. And in um, prokaryotes, there's two mechanisms for 
allowing transcription termination. You can either have intrinsic termination or row dependent termination. Um, now, row dependent termination, this is what I call protein based. Um, it actually requires the action of what's called a row protein, which is a type of helicase um, to um, play a role in termination. So what it does is the row protein will bind to your um, mRNA strand that's being synthesized and will track along the mRNA strand um, behind your RNA polymerase. And your RNA polymerase is on your DNA template. So both are continuing along on their merry way. And then your RNA polymerase hits this run of G nucleotides. And that causes the RNA polymerase to stall or to pause. So now your RNA polymerase has paused on the DNA template, but your rho factor or your rho protein is still tracking along on the mRNA strand. So at some point it will collide with your RNA polymerase. And that interaction causes enough instability that the mRNA um, strand is actually able to break off and released from your termination, uh, sorry, your transcription bubble. So that's how you can terminate transcription with this row dependent or row mediated method. Intrinsic termination, on the other hand, involves specific sequences of DNA, um, specifically what are called your inverted repeats. So you'll have um, your termination sequence, and the termination sequence is comprised of inverted repeats that are separated by a spacer sequence, followed by a polyadenine sequence. Now, inverted repeats are sequences that, of either DNA or RNA that are reverse complements of one another. So you have these termination sequences at the end of your transcription unit. Um, your little RNA polymerase is moving along and encounters this um, run of GC nucleotides. At this point, your mRNA strand will fold back on itself, and complementary CG nucleotides will base pair together. So what you actually get is internal base pairing, and that allows the formation of the secondary structure called a stable hairpin. Now, your stable hairpin will stall the RNA polymerase before it can begin tr transcribing this AA or AT rich nucleotide region. So your RNA polymerase is stalled somewhere along here. Um, and at that time, your complementary UA or U region of the mRNA is forming weak interactions with that area of the template. Um, and they're not, again, they're weak interactions, they're not stable. So that coupled with the stalled um, polymerase because of your stable hairpin causes enough instability that the RNA polymerase basically releases your mRNA strand and that mRNA strand is then um, liberated from the template. Okay, so again, Eukaryotes always have to be more complex. So at this part, um, after termination, if you were a eukaryote, you'd be done. Everything's done. But with eukaryotes, the story isn't completely over. Um, so termination um, requires, again, these processing activities. You can't just have a little protein come along and um, basically cut your mRNA and be done with it. Your mRNA has to go and eukaryotes has to go through processing. And there are um, three processing activities. You have the addition of a five prime cap, um, a three pi, sorry, three prime poly A tail, and the removal of introns. And again, that's all done to produce your uh, final mRNA product, and it's the final mRNA product that will be used in translation. Okay, so the 
all of these uh, processing activities for your eukaryotic um, termination of transcription, they start occurring as soon as transcription elongation begins. So after the first 20 to 30 nucleotides of your pre-mRNA are transcribed or created, um, you have the addition of what's called a five prime cap. And that's added to the five prime end of your, um, your synthesizing mRNA strand. And this five prime cap is composed of a seven methyl guanosine. Now a seven methyl guanosine is just a guanine nucleotide that has been methylated at the seventh position. So this molecule or the seven methyl guanosine cap is added to or joined to your RNA chain in a very unique five prime to five prime linkage where you actually get these three phosphodiester link uh, bonds here, not bonds, sorry, you get your three phosphate molecules. Um, now what's the whole purpose of this? Well, the addition of the five prime cap enhances the ability of the ribosome to bind with the mRNA in translation. And in general, it also just helps to stabilize your mRNA. On the other end of the spectrum, at the three prime end, you have, sorry for all the fire hydrants and police, um, you have what's called polyadenylation. Now, polyadenylation um, is a process that's catalyzed by poly A polymerase. And the process relies on what are called poly A signal sites in your, sorry, I didn't know if the motorcycle would um, complete, tone out my voice. Anyway, so your um, poly A polymerase, it catalyzes your polyadenylation and that relies on poly A signal sites in your RNA as well as multiple proteins. And these proteins will act as cleavage factors. So how does it actually occur? Well, an AAUAAA, this guy right here, sequence um, located slightly upstream of your proper three prime end signals that the RNA chain should be cleaved approximately 10 to 35 nucleotides downstream from this signal site. Um, and once that happens, it should be followed by the addition of a poly A tail, uh, which would be catalyzed by your poly A polymerase. So your poly A polymerase binds to your mRNA and cleaves the three prime end. It then synthesizes your polyadenylated tail by adding, um, adding what are called adenine messengers or your A nucleotides, it's these here. Um, to the cleavage site. And additional proteins will bind to the tail as well. Um, and that helps to increase the rate at which the tail grows. So once the tail has reached its full or maximal length, uh, the poly A polymerase is signaled to stop adding residues or your A nucleotides. And then um, that signals that the polyadenylation process is complete. So again, What's the purpose of this? Why go through with polyadenylation? Well, first of all, it helps in the exportation of mRNA from the nucleus. Remember your um, mRNA, it starts as pre-mRNA, goes through your processing to become the full mRNA strand, but then it has to be transported through a nuclear pore of your nuclear envelope into your cytoplasm so that it can then be reached by a ribosome so it can be translated into a protein. Um, and at that point, you need protection from what are called exonucleases. So these are really nasty enzymes that work by cleaving uh, nucleotides one by one um, from each other. And it does this by um, inducing a hydrolysis reaction. Um, and that's the addition of a water molecule to break those phosphodiester bonds. And it does that at either the three prime or the five prime end. Now, the reason you want to avoid that is because if you have enough breakage of nucleotides from either one of your ends, either the five prime end or the three prime end, there's a threat or a likelihood that you could actually start taking nucleotides from your 
coding sequence or the, um, the nucleotides that will be used to translate into proteins. Um, and if that happens, then you run the risk of getting a non-functional protein or having some sort of mutation that could be deleterious to the organism. Um, the whole process of polyadenylation also helps in initiating translation. Um, and then in general, it just helps with um, the termination of transcription. Now the last and third um, processing activity that occurs is intron removal. And this relies on um, small nuclear ribonucleoprotein particles, or SNRPs. Um, and these are complexes made of small nuclear RNAs and proteins. And there are six SNRPs. They're uh, really creatively named U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. Again, very creative. I know. I wish I came up with it. I always say that. Anyway, so each one has a specific function. So your U1 SNRP will recognize um, some sort of signature sequence on the five prime side of the intron and will bind there uh, through some sort of RNA-RNA interaction. And then your U2 SNRP recognizes and binds to a different signature sequence. Um, I think it's called the branch point sequence, which is at the three prime end of your intron. So you have, um, now you have your one, U1 at the five prime and your U2 at the three prime end of the intron. So both will flank the intron and thus serve as your splice junctions or your uh, splicing sites. Now your U6 and your U4 will bind together and then kind of team up with your U5. Um, and they form this SNRP team that will then bind with the U1 and the U2. And together, all six form um, a specialized complex called your spliceosome, which is this guy here. So the spliceosome will cleave um, the pre-mRNA at that five prime splice junction. Um, and at this, this time, your U4 will dissociate. Um, but doesn't have a big function. So you cleave your five prime end, and this causes the intron to start being pushed together. Your uh, your cleaved five prime end will start um, being pushed towards that three prime end to form this kind of fruit loop looking shape. And then those two ends will seal together or be pinched together. And that's what allows the spliceosome to pinch off your intron. So that excised intron, again, looks more like this little fruit loop than an actual sequence of DNA. Once that intron is removed by the spliceosome, the spliceosome will then um, splice together those ends of the exon. Um, and it does this by forming phosphodiester linkages. So your introns, again, when we have your eukaryotic genes, the actual coding region of the gene is comprised of discrete units. Um, you have exons and you have introns. Your introns are those sequences that will be removed, therefore not included in your final mature mRNA product. A lot of these are just non-coding sequences. They're, they're like nonsense um, regions. Your exons, on the other hand, are those regions that will be contributed or will be included in your mature mRNA product. Um, so these are the regions that actually contain your um, true coding uh, regions, and they'll be spliced together to form your mature mRNA. Now, this gets into this awesome process um, or topic called alternative splicing. Um, now, alternative splicing is this um, really highly regulated uh, process during gene expression that allows you to determine uh, what exons of a gene can be included with or excluded from the final processed mRNA. Um, so in other words, it is this regulated process that results in a single gene that can code for multiple proteins. And again, it does this by 
determining which exons are included in and which ex exons are excluded from your final processed mRNA product. Um, so this results in alternate forms of mRNA and different forms of proteins. For example, we see this with your calcitonin gene. Um, you can either get the production of the true calcitonin uh, protein or um, hormone, or you can get this calcitonin gene related peptide kind of thing. And again, that's based on what exons are included in your final mRNA product. So here, if you include your three orange exons and the pink A exon, you get a product called your CGRP hormone. And this is made in your neuronal cells and acts as a vasodilator to affect pain transmission. If you have your three orange exons and these two blue exon A's, you get a completely different uh, protein product. You get a product called calcitonin, which is also a hormone that's created in your thyroid cells and is used to regulate calcium. So alternative splicing is how um, we are able to synthesize or create 90,000 different um, proteins from only 25,000 genes um, because it maximizes the genome. You can have a single gene that's coding for different proteins. Um, and this is very efficient. It uses up less space. Um, and it's also just a fact that most of the um, DNA in your eukaryotes are non-coding sequences. Um, so again, you can get an enormous amount of proteins formed from those coding regions by just changing what exons are included and excluded from. Now, there's a downside to it. Um, many of these mutations that arise um, that allow uh, really deleterious diseases are mutations that occur from um, some sort of splicing effect. Um, they either retain an intron that should not be retained and that causes a non-functional protein or a mutated protein, um, or they cause the wrong um, sequence or wrong inclusion of exons to create a faulty uh, product. So that is the end of transcription. Um, thank you for listening and watching, and I hope that did not put you to sleep or serve as a cure for insomnia.